Baseball 86 with John Fricke. CNN's Baseball 86. It's all-star time. A look at the lineups for both teams. We'll take a look back at the first half of this season, the big stories, and the booming box office. Plus, Horner homers himself into the record book. We have a triple play and Boston's big break, a balk. Those stories and much more on Baseball 86. Hello and welcome to CNN's Baseball 86. I'm John Fricke as we take a look at the All-Star game today. It is indeed the traditional halfway point in the season. We are nearing the All-Star break right here, right around the corner this week. Tuesday night at the Astrodome in Houston, the best from the American and National League will square off for bragging rights. This year, the balloting, of course, had a slight change. A player from each team was on the ballot at each position. And for the first time ever, a rookie not only appeared on the card, but also took the voting by storm. More on the American League All-Stars from CNN's Gary Miller. For the first time in the game's 57 editions, a rookie has been voted to start. California's Wally Joyner has not only made the most of his opportunity with the Angels, in the first year that rookies have been included on fans' ballots, he outpolled reigning MVP Don Mattingly as the American League starting first baseman. While Joyner's average has hovered at or above 300 throughout the season, he has also been at or near the lead in home runs and RBI. All this in replacing the game's perennial all-star Rod Carew at California. Kansas City's George Brett crept closer to approaching Carew's record of 15 straight starts, bettering Wade Boggs in the balloting for his 11th straight appearance at third base to open the game. The top vote-getter in the league was Cal Ripken, nearly a million and a half fans picking the Orioles shortstop. And for the third straight year, the Tigers' Lou Whitaker starts at second base, as the entire infield, except for Joyner, encores its 85 appearances. That includes Whitaker's teammate, Lance Parrish, at catcher, also over a million votes, more than a half million more than runner-up Jim Sundberg of Kansas City. Ricky Henderson was the top vote-getter among the outfielders. He'll be flanked by fellow Yankee Dave Winfield, who has had trouble cracking the New York outfield lately, mired in a prolonged slump, and a tete-a-tete -tete with George Steinbrenner. In all, six of the eight starters are making a return engagement. Minnesota's Kirby Puckett, the other exception. Puckett makes his debut by barely edging Reggie Jackson, who was making a bid for his 15th appearance. He trailed the Angel Slugger by 7,500 votes before overtaking Jackson on the last ballot. Puckett, the first twin to earn a start since Roy Smalley seven years ago. Now, not everyone agrees with the fan selections. The Associated Press surveyed Major League managers and found out that they would choose, among others, Wade Boggs to start at third base for the American League and not George Brett. As it turns out, Boggs will start. Brett will now miss the All-Star game with a shoulder injury. His roster spot was filled by Indians third baseman Brooks Jacoby. The other third baseman reserve is Jim Presley of the Seattle Mariners. Looking at the rest of the American League reserves, Tony Fernandez, who the managers said they would vote to start at shortstop from Toronto. He is joined by Frank White of the Kansas City Royals. At first base, Don Mattingly of the Yankees to be expected, and Eddie Murray, and what a crew they have there with Wally Joyner. What a threesome. At catcher, the backup is Rick Gedman of the Boston Red Sox. He's had a great year. Another Red Sox in the outfield, Jim Rice, along with Harold Banner, year Baines of the Chicago White Sox. Jesse Barfield, who's been on a tear, and his teammate Lloyd Mosby are joined by Jose Canseco, the rookie supreme from Oakland in the outfield. As you might expect, the starting pitcher for the American League will be Boston's Roger Clemens at 14-2. The other members of the staff, Ted Aguera of Milwaukee, Mike Witt of California, Texas' Charlie Huff, Don Ossie, who's had a great season for Baltimore in the bullpen, Willie Hernandez, and Dave Rigetti from the Yankees round out the American League pitching staff, the American League team. Well, voting over in the senior circuit, the National League took a decided trend towards popularity and not necessarily production. Again, CNN's Gary Miller with a story on the starters for the senior circuit. Equaling their domination in the standings, the Mets monopolized the all-star balloting. Including the probable starting pitcher, New York names number nearly half the starting roster. No one was more popular with the fans in either league than Daryl Strawberry. For the third straight year, he is starting in the outfield, and no other National League player in history has started his career with that trifecta. Second in the balloting, but starting twice as long is catcher Gary Carter. He has opened every game since 1981 when he won MVP honors. And in typical fashion, he celebrated his ninth overall selection by smashing his 14th home run Thursday night. The Mets trio is completed by Keith Hernandez, earning his first starting berth. Coming off the year in which he gained most of his notoriety from the Pittsburgh drug trial, Hernandez also earned his eighth straight gold glove and overcame the negative publicity to edge ever popular Steve Garvey. The rest of the infield also has a familiar look about it. Mike Schmidt back at third base with the Phillies and with the National League. 
A year ago, he missed the All-Star game for the first time since 1978. The Cardinals' Ozzie Smith won his fourth straight honor with his bat as well as his glove. And the Cubs' Ryan Sandberg encores his start at second base. The fifth National Leaguer to garner over a million votes was Atlanta's Dale Murphy, who will make his fifth straight start, despite what for him is an off year, just 36 runs batted in. Tony Gwynn completes the starting lineup, leading the league and batting most of the season and just holding off a late charge by the Expos' Tim Raines. And now the National League Reserves, Chris Brown, who certainly earned a spot from the San Francisco Giants. What a bat he swung this year. Hubie Brooks from Montreal at short, Steve Sachs from the Dodgers at second base. Glenn Davis, the home run at King so far in the National League. At first, Jody Davis and Tony Pena of the Pirates will be the back backup catchers. In the outfield for the National League, Tim Raines of Montreal, who just missed, as Gary said, being voted in. Kevin Bass of Houston, Tilly Davis of San Francisco, and Dave Parker of the Cincinnati Reds. Dwight Gooden, as you might expect from the Mets, is going to be the starter, joined by a couple other Mets in this staff. Mike Scott from Houston, Rick Roden from the Pittsburgh Pirates, Shane Raleigh, who's had a super year for Philadelphia, Sid Fernandez, who's now got 12 wins after last night for the Mets, Fernando Valenzuela from the Dodgers, Mike Kruko from San Francisco, Cincinnati's John Franco, Dave Smith of Houston, and the final pitching member, Jeff Reardon of the Montreal Expos. Now, not everybody has been happy with the way these teams were Selected, and we'll tell you why in just a second. Gary Miller will have live reports from Houston beginning Tuesday. His coverage from the All-Star site at the Astrodome starts tomorrow. So Gary Miller on CNN Sports to bring you the full story from the Astrodome, the All-Star game, the American and National League. And I mentioned that not everybody's happy, and Gary will tell you about that. Dennis Oil Camboy to the Boston Red Sox, matter of fact, was furious when he found out that for the second straight year he had missed the team. He certainly thought he belonged on the American League pitching staff. He skipped out on a game from Fenway Park Thursday saying, quote, I'm an angry young man, unquote. The Red Sox weren't too happy. They suspended Boyd for three games without pay, which should cost him around $6,000. Well, it has been one wild week in baseball when we return a triple play, a great comeback, and plenty else to make you say, oh, my. That and more in a minute after this look at last night's scores. There is a big story brewing in the bullpen of the Kansas City Royals. Could last year's Cy Young winner be relegated to relieving? Brett Saberhagen, World Series MVP, the king of Kansas City, is certainly struggling. Last night against Detroit in the first game of a doubleheader, Saberhagen went seven innings, struck out seven, wasn't involved in the decision as the Royals won the game 4-3. Saberhagen right now is 4-10 and ten and has not been doing what everybody thought he would. His breaking ball is not breaking. He's falling behind hitters. As a result, he thinks that he could have to go to the bullpen. Now, Royals manager Dick Hauser said he would wait until last night to make his decision on whether or not to send Saberhagen to the pen. Saberhagen appears ready for the demotion, saying, quote, it will probably, probably be uh, the bullpen for me until I get myself together, unquote. Well, that leaves sort of a busy news from the front office this week, where we start in Cincinnati. The Reds, now starting to surge, suffered a setback when shortstop Davy Concepcion broke his left hand in a collision with Montreal's Vance Law. The Reds say Concepcion will have the hand in a cast and will be lost for at least three weeks. In San Diego, the story's the return of Ed Whitson, reacquired from the Yankees in a trade for Tim Stoddard. Whitson was one of the keys in the Padres' tenant year of 1984. I think uh, Ed's problems were basically uh, not being able to handle the atmosphere and the the New York uh, area, and of course, as Mendel says in his books, the New York Zoo. But um, uh, I think there's been a certain, uh, uh, certainly psychologically uh, affected him up there. And uh, I know talking to him today, he was said the greatest news he's had in 1986 to get back to some place where he uh, he felt like he was very happy here, and uh, he's anxious to show us that uh, he's a better pitcher than he was in '84. 
Los Angeles is looking towards the second half. The Dodgers just want to get healthy, and their depleted lineup bolstered by the return of first baseman Greg Brock to make room for Brock the Dodgers' option shortstop Craig Shipley back to Albuquerque. And in Atlanta, the streak is over. Dale Murphy played in 740 straight games, the 10th longest stint in history over four years in a row. But Murphy sat out. Nothing wrong with him, just wanted to take the pressure off. Murph responded with a fresh back, clubbing three hits the next night. The longest streak now belongs to Baltimore's Cal Ripken Jr., who's approaching 700 games himself. You know, Baseball 86 has been a very fun, sometimes frustrating, but always fascinating story. We took a few minutes yesterday, sat down, and decided what the top ten stories of the year have been so far. Here's our list from number ten to number one. We start with the home run, the long ball. Overall, Major League teams on a record home run pace with Minnesota leading the way. Number nine is Don Sutton. The seemingly ageless pitcher became the fourth active pitcher to reach the magic milestone of 300 career wins. Number eight is trouble in Chicago. Both Windy City teams changed managers after slow starts. Now the White Sox talk of changing stadiums, fleeing Comiskey Park to the suburbs. Number seven are those amazing Mets. Their first half start had people giving them the NLE's crown before July rolled around. In at number six, old faces, new places. Tom Seaver changed his socks going from Chicago to Boston in a trade, while Steve Carlton spoke, broke an eight-year silence to the media after being signed by San Francisco. Number five, champs, now chumps. The two World Series teams have both made Missouri misery as both the Cards and Royals went from the top towards the bottom. Number four, teams once terrible, now terrors. Texas, Cleveland, and San Francisco have all been at the top of their divisions, a feat no one would have dreamed on opening day. In at number three, Bo Goes Baseball. The Heisman Trophy winner spurned big dollars from the NFL as Bo Jackson signed with Kansas City, but Bo has struggled in double-A ball. Number two, rookies on the rise. Pete Incavilla, fresh from college to the pros, instrumental in the rise of the Rangers. Jose Canseco, long ball supreme for Oakland, one of the leading home run hitters in the majors. And Wally Joyner, the man who replaced Rod Carew and became the first rookie ever chosen to start an all-star game. And the top story so far this season, the man they call the Rocket. Roger Clemens, his 14 straight wins and his record 20 strikeouts in one game had fans across the nation following his every pitch. That was one of the reasons the turnstiles really started spinning this year. How is Major League Baseball doing as a spectator sport in 1986? Baseball at the box office, once again near record pace. Last year, the two leagues combined for a record 46 million fans. Combined, they're slightly over 24 million near the halfway mark in 86. And with the promise of big pennant races in big cities, records could fall again this season. Now, despite their lowly record, again, the L.A. Dodgers lead the way. Los Angeles has drawn over 1,800,000 fans to... Chavez Ravine. On the other end, Montreal, even with the second best record in the National League, the Expos are last in total attendance. They are, however, slightly ahead of Pittsburgh in terms of average crowd. Toronto and California, again, leading the way in the American League, both nearing a million three in total attendance. The biggest winners at the box office so far, Cleveland and San Francisco, both of which have already passed their season totals from 85, and Texas, which is already over a million and will set a new club record this season, no doubt. In all, 11 teams are now past the million mark with five more that will reach that plateau during their next homestand. Well, once again, of course, the All-Star Game is in Houston this Tuesday. It is the fourth in history that will be played in a dome stadium, and that's the basis for today's baseball baffler. Our question, name the other three All-Star Games to be played in dome stadiums. And if you want a real test, tell us the years. We'll have the answer in just a minute. in Houston. It is the fourth in history under a dome stadium. What were the other three and what years were they held? Well, the first was also at the Astrodome in 1968. Eleven years later, Seattle played host in the Kingdom, and just last year, if you've already forgotten, Minnesota's Metrodome was the site. This year makes it four total and two straight All-Star games in a dome. An update on the Goodwill Games, that and more when CNN's Baseball 86 continues in a minute. The rest of baseball says the baseball players try to pull back catch their breath right before the all-star break if anything this very well may have been the weirdest and wildest week of the season so far enough stuff coming in bunches to make you say oh my and indeed there was a lot to say oh my last night in new york gary carter first inning david palmer kiss it gone 
a three-run home run for Gary Carter. Now, that was only the start of the real fireworks. Carter took a bow, threw a punch in the air, and then David Palmer responded by hitting the next batter, Daryl Strawberry, who tried to throw a punch after getting hit with the glove and the ball. The two teams emptied their benches as they both went after each other. Then Carter came up in the second inning. This is not a replay. It is the second inning. This, a grand slam home run. Two at-bats, two home runs, seven RBIs, and two innings for Gary Carter as the Mets pounded Atlanta 11 to nothing. Meanwhile, this, watch closely, is a triple play. The ball hit right back to Ed Lynch. That's one out to third is two, and the easy throw to first, a triple play. The Cubs turned it against the Giants, and that had to make Ed Lynch one very surprised pitcher. The hit and run was on, and when I threw the ball, I heard it, uh, the first baseman go, there he goes. So I knew the guy on first was going to be almost at second base. And when I caught the ball, my first reaction was to go to third base to try to double him up, because I figured he was only about five feet off the bag. And when I caught the ball, I just turned around and threw right there, and uh, we did double him up at third. And then first base was easy. The guy was rounding second almost, and he could have walked it over there. But uh, it's a great way to get out of a jam, I'll tell you. But hitters had their day. Bob Horner of the Braves became the first in 25 years to do this. Four home runs in one game against Montreal. Four home runs. He had five at-bats. His second right here. They all look like carbon copies. Number 15 on the year, a solo shot to left center. Number 16, a three-run blast down the line and left. And then in the ninth inning with two out and a 3-2 count, Horner stepped up and drilled a Jeff Reardon pitch toward the gap that fell over the fence for home run number four as Bob Horner hit four home runs in one game. Well, you don't ever, ever plan anything like that happen in your career. Uh, it's one of those things that happens once in a lifetime. You never expect anything like that to happen, but it did, and uh, I just wish we would have won the ball game. Indeed, they lost. The weirdest finish of the year came in the Boston-California game. Tied at four, the game went to extra innings. In the 12th, California broke it open. They scored three times and looked like they had this game well in hand. Matter of fact, the folks at Fenway could have just walked home and said, okay, we understand that this game is getting out of hand. The Angels simply got everything going their way. Wally Joyner scored after tripling, and that made it 5-4. Things got much worse for the Red Sox. It was 7-4, but then they went to the bottom of the inning, and with two out, Jim Rice made it 7-6 with his two-run shot over the wall and left. This is when things really got weird. A couple of batters reached base, and then that sent this man to the plate. With two out, a little pop fly towards third base. Rick Burleson had it, and then dropped it. The winning run then scored to tie the game at seven. Then Rich Gedman came off the bench, drilled this shot, and uh, kept the, the game alive, as he tied, actually tied the game right here at seven with this two-out single. That meant that men were on first and third. A new pitcher came in, didn't even throw one pitch as Todd Fisher was called for a balk that sent in the winning run. The Red Sox had rallied for four runs with two out in the bottom of the 12th thanks to a two-run home run, a clutch single, a kind of a weird error, and a balk to beat the Angels 8-7 and probably the weirdest finish you're going to see all season. Well, tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, CNN Sports Saturday, a full half hour with the full story from baseball today, and if it's anything like it's been this week, you're definitely going to want to catch up on the action. Tomorrow at this time, CNN Sports Week, Terry Chick, along with the day and week in sports, and then Dan Marino will be... That'll do it for this edition of CNN's Baseball 86. The news continues here on CNN.